So tonight's topic <laughs> is, um, is uh, one of the more interesting aspects of archaeology that a lot of people really don't think about, and that's the, the dynamics of human subsistence, the procurement of food, um, making stone tools, and how that relates to, to, to meat. And, and for myself, I've had kind of a tortured relationship with meat my whole life. I love it. <laughs> Um, as a wee undergraduate at the University of Arizona Department of Anthropology, uh, I was at University Drug one day, and this beautiful Krishna girl was passing out the, the vegan cookbooks. And I, I, she asked me if I wanted one, and being a typical anthro smartass, I turned to her and said, no thanks, I'm a carnivore. She turned to me and said, it shows. <laughs> So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our <laughs> resident experts, and we're going to learn more about meat and the procurement thereof. I'd like to introduce Alan DeNoyer, Karen, and I've, I've stressed the last, the last name, Schoenmeyer. Schoenmeyer. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn the talk over. Okay. Uh, to begin, we're just going to introduce ourselves and tell you uh, a little bit about ourselves, what we do. Um, uh, my name is Alan DeNoyer. I work for Archaeology Southwest here in Tucson, um, and I've just I've been here about a year now. But I'm a contract archaeologist for years. But my thing that I do on the side, and it's taken over my archaeology now, is a lot of experimental archaeology and replicating and making prehistoric artifacts and houses and all kinds of things like that. And so that's the perspective I'm bringing into it tonight with our talk. And so that we can kind of, if you guys have questions about what we're talking about any time during the talk, please ask us and we'll try to do a lot of uh, back and forth with that. I'm Karen Schulmeyer, and uh, I also work at Archaeology Southwest. I started about the same time as Alan did. And I study animal bones from archaeological sites. Uh, and I also work, I've worked largely in the Membrace area. I worked on some collections from Mesa Verde in the Four Corners and different places in the Southwest, but um, my analytical specialty is animal bones, so hopefully Alan and I will really complement each other well in that way, and that he studies the tools people use to catch these animals and cut them into pieces, and I study the tiny little pieces that are left afterwards. So we're, um, we don't have a formal sort of speech to give tonight, which makes me terribly nervous, but I think it'll be okay. We have a <laughs> list of things that we want to talk about on the subject of the archaeology of me, and we're hoping that people will jump in and ask questions as we go along, because it's not a really formal sort of discussion. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping to have a conversation with us and a conversation with all of you about different things about this topic of the archaeology of meat and where animals came from and how people got them and what they did with them when they had them and the tools they used to get them. So we thought we'd start out talking a little bit about very early hunting in the Southwest. Uh, Alan and I have both worked a lot in the Southwest. Alan has also worked in other places like the Plains uh, most of my experience, as I said, has been in New Mexico and Arizona, uh, mostly on things from later than about 1000 AD, and Alan has worked on some much older sites, uh, but I've dealt with data from other times and places. So we'll be talking a little bit about our different experiences as we, as we answer questions and discuss these things. But we thought we'd start out with old meat, uh, <laughs> some of the earliest hunting that we can see evidence of in the Southwest and the tools that people used to get those animals and what kinds of animals they were using. Yeah, uh, my favorite kind is the old meat. It's cured really good, it's, it's good stuff. So early on in North America, we, it's, there's only a little bit of sites, there's not a lot of evidence, but we happen to live in an area where there's quite a bit of evidence down on the San Pedro of a number of Clovis kill sites where they were killing mammoths. And one of the, aspects of that is that, and the reason we know that that happened is the hunting strategy. So when people are going out and hunting animals and game, there is a whole bunch more that goes into it. When our, as archaeologists, we're just looking at the end product most of the time. We're digging a site and we're finding the bones in the site and we're interpreting those bones from the site. But there's a whole bunch of cultural stuff that went on before they were able to even kill those animals. People have been studying the animals. They knew the animals' habits. They knew where they were going to be at certain times of the year, certain times of the day, and they knew how to sneak up, get close to them, and eventually kill them. So when you look at these archaeological sites, like the mammoth kill sites down on the San Pedro, there's a whole lot more that went on that we cannot see in the archaeological record. And so 
That's one of the things that I do by going out and replicating a lot of these tools. One of the recent, I don't know if you saw, there's a recent article that just came out about Clovis and a, a gentleman up in Canada has done some research and he's figured out studying the impact fractures of the Clovis points that they find in these kill sites and around that they were definitely, there's no doubt about it, these points were shot with mechanisms like this, like an atlatl. They were, they were shot with a tool that they could use to propel the darts at a high rate of force that when they hit bone and, and the ground and things, the impact that they cause is much greater than be can be caused by using a thrusting spear and stabbing an animal or any other way like that. So we're learning all these things all the time about this hunting process. And so when you look at these tools, one of the reasons for making these tools and experimenting with gives us a much better idea what we're looking at when we're excavating these sites. Um, so, This is a really interesting use of experimental archaeology, this article that Alan was talking about to me. I didn't even realize until I read it that there was a debate about whether people were using things like adlatls to throw these projectiles because I can't imagine poking a mammoth with a spear. <laughs> Getting that close to it sounds terrible, but there was an argument about whether spears were being basically poked into these large animals or just thrown with your arm or whether there were actually adlatls and things like that being used to throw these projectiles uh, because it turns out they'd never found an adlatl from the Paleo-Indian site. They had found ones from the Archaic period, but there were no Paleo-Indian adlatls. So that was kind of a surprise to me, but this study uh, they looked at the characteristics of the fractures on broken and damaged points and were able to figure out that those fractures occurred with such force that you can't throw a spear that, that hard. Yeah. So it, it's pretty amazing that, you know, finally that's a kind of a little side factor that's been figured out just recently. That that's what really happened. We've speculated for years. Everybody's, all the artists' reconstructions show people down with Adelato shooting them at the animals. But now... We know that that's, there's proof of that. So another interesting factor on that note, we don't know what the atlatls look like, say, at Murray Springs. In Europe, there's a type of atlatl called the commandement, and it's a stick that's shaped a lot like this right here. And at Murray Springs, they found a bone wrench that's shaped an awful lot like this, that if you strap a piece of leather to it, and then you take your atlatl dart, and you wrap the end of your leather around the distal end of your atlatl dart. This is, I should have cut that end off a little bit. And you just wrap it around the end, and then you hold it up. Actually, I'm sorry, I did it backwards. You hold it up near this end, and you throw it, just like you're using an atlatl, like that. You can get it patched on there quite right. But you throw it just like you would throw an atlatl dart. Hand over motion. Shoo, like this, and you're coming over whew, tons of force, and you've got this long strap that propels that dart much harder, much faster than you could with your bare hands. So, I know that maybe looks weird, we but it have works. found an atlatl. <laughs> it's possible. These things work. We used these last summer at the field school in New Mexico, and it worked quite well. It worked quite well. So, a lot of times we have things under our noses that we don't know what we've got. We've had the evidence for what was killing, what they, were trying, what they were using to kill the mammoths with for a long time. It's just learning how to interpret what we're seeing archaeologically. So, and the other reason that it's really neat about mammoths, and it tells a story about how the hunting was done on the earliest folks is on the, on the San Pedro, so many of these mammoths are found in these boggy spring spots. So they're following these animals into these springs where they're getting bogged down, where they're slowed down, so they can get in close from a higher vantage point and shoot into them and have a much easier shot of shooting them rather than out on the open prairie or wherever. Um, and uh, it, it probably explains why we're finding them where we find them. They're taking that opportune spot. Maybe they've already stuck some darts in them and then the mammoths are injured and then they go down to these springs and crawl in to drink and then they're, you know, and then they finish them off. So that's why we find those. That's why we don't find evidence of them hunting a lot of other animals that they probably were hunting as well. Yeah, I think in time. a way that factor makes us really overthink the meat in the early time period because most of the sites we have from the Paleo-Indian period, we recognize them because they have these very distinctive projectile points. 
and they have the bones of great big extinct animals. If it's just a little flake scatter, we have no way of telling what time period it's from. So there's a big segment of what people were doing a long, long time ago that we're actually missing because we have so few recognized sites that are from that time that aren't these kill sites for hunting. So we think people are probably eating a lot of little animals, they're probably eating a lot of plants, but we just don't recognize those sites as easily. So if you were to graph out a picture of the ratio of big things to little things through time, which I've done in various places, um, and you look at the Paleo-Indian period, it looks like almost all the sites are just eating a bunch of huge things. They probably were eating a lot of huge things, but they're probably eating a lot of other things too that we just don't really have a lot of evidence for. Do you guys have questions about that time period? Again, it's not particularly my expertise, but it is something that I read about a lot, and Alan has actually worked on some of those sites. So uh, if you have any questions about hunting in that time period or these weapons we've been talking about. A couple yeah. questions already. I'm going to start back here. <laughs> Thank you. Do we know what order of magnitude is the increase of force by using an atlatl? Not off the top of my head, but this article that we're talking about, um, it sounds like there's a very clear division. There's a category of force that you only get from a projectile throwing device like a bow yeah. and arrow or an atlatl. Uh, there's like a category of force that you can get from javelin type throwing and also hard flaking. And then there's a category of force that you get from uh, basically poking or um, flaking very delicately like by pushing an antler against a stone tool. And those three categories have very different signatures. So it's possible that you could throw a, throw a projectile with an atlatl and have it slow way down and have an impact fracture that looks like it was poked, but you can't poke something and make the kind of fracture that looks like an atlatl fracture. Yeah, and the atlatl, uh Basically, all, what you're doing is you're increasing the length of your arm. It's a lever principle. So it's double, maybe triple the time, amount of force that you could normally throw with. So if I'm out playing with a dart, I can throw it out on a football field 30, 40 yards by hand real easily. But with the atlatl dart, I can throw it 100 yards easily. So instead of just sticking the dart in a little ways, I can stick it halfway in. And, and actually, on that note, real quick, and I got some things to pass around, but the atlatl darts, what makes the atlatl darts so interesting is that they had these four shafts, and you could pretend this is a Clovis point. This is actually a Sienega point that I have stuck in here, which is a early agricultural time period point down here. But these four shafts were pressure socketed fit into the front end of the atlatl dart, boom. So when the hunter threw it, the dart comes in and hits the animal, boom, and the impact punches the foreshaft into the animal. But because they're only pressure fit in, what the hunter wants to have happen is the dart pops off, leaves the rest of the dart laying on the ground and the foreshaft in the animal. So you don't maybe run up and scare the animal. Boom, the animal's going to be freaking out. It's going to take off. You let the animal run, and you go back, and you retrieve your dart, and you load a new foreshaft. So it's a really good way of not happen to carry too much gear on a hunt and be mobile and follow your animal. And so, um, uh, and four shafts were used throughout prehistory on all hunting weapons from through the atlatl time periods into the bow and arrow time periods. All bow and arrows had little four shafts that socketed in the front end like this one. And at some point here, I'll pass, start passing some of these items around so you guys can all kind of look at them. But then once again, they had a little teeny force shaft that socketed in the front end. So if you shot something, and like with an arrow, it's more likely that they, it was just an expedient way once they were able to retrieve the arrows to re-put a new projectile point on without having to sit down and re-sinew it. But... Um, if, if you didn't do that and the whole dart went into the animal and it takes off running, it could bump against trees and things and break your dart. And it's a lot more work to fix that dart. You just can't do that in five minutes on a hunt and then go back and try to shoot the animal that you just killed. It might die, it might get away. So um, it's, it was really ingenious. And so every projectile point you see that's on the landscape everywhere at one point or another had a little four shaft attached to it. So, the key thing about these things is that they're just a little teeny piece of the hunting equipment. It was part of a much larger system. It's just the very, the tip of the spear, so to speak. 
So, um, I think we had another question questions? here. What <clears throat> before the the thought was that it was a uh, Adelaide. What did they think that the Murray Springs Ranch? What purpose it served? For for straightening spears. For for say you have a a, a dart shaft like this. And the, the, the theory is that they were running it down it to flex it. You heat, you heat it. Say if you have a, a, a dart shaft that you want to straighten, the best way to do it is you soak it, it's wet, and you heat it in a fire. You get it really warm, really hot, where you can almost not touch it. And then you flex it the opposite direction of whatever the bend is. And the heat causes the wood to kind of lose its memory from where it was. And then it flexes back and straightens out. So by doing that back and forth, back and forth, heating, flexing, heating, flexing, maybe you need to re-soak it a little bit, heat, flex, heat, flex. You can straighten them out to just super, super straight. Um, this is a cheater one. It says bamboo from the hardware store. Um, and he heats them with a hair dryer too. Which yeah, is and I cheat. <laughs> with, with the fire dangers around here, you just can't be building <laughs> fires everywhere most of the time. So hair dryers work fantastic. Or even better, those hot air guns. Mm. If they'd have had them, they'd have used them for sure. That's. <laughs> okay, but this, it looks very odd, but it works really well. I mean, we had kids at our archaeology fair who could throw with this right away. It, it looks very cumbersome and strange to me, but it was actually pretty easy for us to throw. I was really surprised. And you'll see pictures of these uh, in sites. You'll see pictures of things that look like this from sites in Europe, from sites in the Americas. They are out there. It's just there's been a lot of debate about what they are. Right? This is definitely a one possibility. Of the things they are, We're not yeah. saying it's for sure, but why? some of them are probably that, though. Yeah. Okay. Next question's here. With, with the Adelatl, is there a continuum of technology? I mean, evolution of the technology seen in the Paleolith Paleolithic in Europe or Eurasia, and where you've seen a progression of efficiency or style, and then ha and has that continued? in North America, or does it look like it's been reinvented here and is an independent collateral kind of evolution of technology? Yeah, that's a really good question. The, the problem with the question is, is there's so very few examples of these things preserved. Um, the vast majority, even into the archaic and early agricultural time periods, the vast majority of the examples we know of are from rock shelters and caves where they've been preserved sometimes in burials, sometimes where they were stored and lost. Um, this is an example of one right here that was found over in Safford at a, at a cave in a rock shelter over there, a McEwen cave. This, the one there it came out of a, of a burial. Um, but So this is a really good example of what they look like down here. But we, there's like, I don't know, you could probably count them on both hands how many have been found in southern Arizona that are known about. There's maybe more floating around out there but they're, they're extremely rare. So we're just basing it on little tidbits of information here and there. This is a guess, this is a hypothesis. We don't know for positive, but it works. It makes a sort of sense. Um, this, is a, this, this, ask, this basket maker, I call it basket maker, it's very much like the basket maker adults up north. This is probably like San Pedro in age down here, 2,000, 2,500 years old, somewhere in that range. This is a pretty neat one actually because it also has several other factors things to it. It's really curved, and I made this one really curved like the one that was found in the cave. In the real life, when it was being used, it may have been much straighter, and it got warped in the grave. But the neat thing about it is, is the handle is completely covered in pitch. Then it has two leather loops, and when you use these, you stick your fingers through the loops and you hold it to your hand. And then there's a hook on the back end, and this is what most of them are like. They have some sort of a hook on the one end, that sockets into the back end of the dart. That hook sockets in, and you hold it in your hands like this, and then you throw it with an overhand throw. If you'd like to demonstrate, I'll catch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that'd be great. Well, another thing to remember about these is, I mean, this is wood, so we don't have 12,000-year-old atlatls from North America. If you look at a book of like European Pale Upper Paleolithic cave art or something like that, You'll see ones that are made of things like bone and antler. They're actually from caves. Yeah. And some of those are amazing. I mean, they have carvings on them of reindeer and all kinds of animals doing different things. There's actually a style 
with uh, a little animal carved on the end that's an ibex. It's a sort of goatee thing they have in Europe. And it's looking, and something's coming out of its back end. Um, and there's actually a raging debate among Upper Paleolithic archaeologists who interpret art about whether the ibex is pooping or giving birth. Um, but whatever it is, that was a really popular style because there's actually multiple examples of that at Laddle. That's the best time to shoot one because it's distracted. <laughs> 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 but to find multiple examples of a thing that has the same decoration is pretty amazing when you think yeah. about how many just aren't <laughs> preserved and how many we never find. Yeah. So I think that's a really good question, but it's very hard to answer because we have so few of them left. There probably were all kinds of different styles that we and don't the know Eastern, about. I mean, all over the country, and they're all over the world. They're everywhere. Everywhere you go in the world, they're there. They're in Australia. People have been there for 50,000 years. I mean, they're, they're, they're not something that they've been around for a long, long, long time. You know, they probably came with people when they migrated to all these different places. They were already part of the toolkit that people were using, for sure. This one's neat because the pitch and then all the cordage and stuff wrapped on the handle is a repair kit for fixing four shafts. The pitch you use to put the projectile point in the four shaft and wrap it with a little cordage and you're ready to go. So after a kill, you break some points, you can fix them. You got everything you need on your atlatl. You don't have to carry it so much. It's kind of neat. That's a theory too, I guess. It makes sense to me. <laughs> so should we move up in time or are yeah, there other Yeah, 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 I think so. <laughs> All right, so um, one of the things that we start to see after the Paleo-Indian period ends, we get into the Archaic and we get into the early agricultural period and we see the projectiles changing and we see the animal bones changing. The big animals disappear. Uh, what Alan calls big animals disappear. <laughs> <laughs> I told you at the beginning, I work mostly on sites after about 1000 AD, and to me, a big animal is a deer. And Alan started laughing. He's like, that's not a big animal. It's a medium animal. Yeah. <laughs> to me, a medium animal is a bunny. <laughs> because that whole category of things disappears from the Southwest after the Paleo Unity period ends. And the biggest thing they're going to get is a, a deer or a pronghorn and maybe an elk in certain parts of the Southwest. Uh, and then they've got those, and they've got bunnies, and they've got little rodents and things. And so their toolkit changes quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So through one of the big changes is in the early Paleo-Indian time periods, and Clovis is just kind of the one we recognize. There's earlier stuff, there's later stuff. But through time, as the animals get smaller, the hunting toolkit gets smaller. Specifically, the projectile points get smaller. They're making smaller points because they're not hunting as big animals. So after Clovis on the plains, they're hunting bison. It goes into what we, the Folsom, you see Folsom stuff. And there's a whole slew of points that are contemporary. And there's contemporary points to Clovis up north and down south. So Clovis is just an example that we use that works really good around here. And it's everywhere, but it's not the beginning. Um, it, it's, we're learning more and more, but Clovis is just somewhere, I don't want to say in the middle, but it's on the beginning end, but there were people here before them. Get off that subject, back to the, the, the smaller projectile points. So now they're hunting smaller animals, so they, they make these smaller projectile points that are plenty adequate for what they need. And they're probably happen to shoot, when you're shooting at deer or antelope or those kinds of animals, you tend to be shooting maybe at a little more of a distance oftentimes. And in fact, if you think about hunting with an atlatl, it's an incredibly huge movement to throw a dart like that. So you're gonna scare every animal. So in a lot of cases, they're probably hunting from blind situations or they're running them into traps and different things. They're, they're using the landscape, the contours of the landscape to run animals into places and maybe into some places up on the plains, up north, they're building corrals for antelope and all these animals. So they're running them into these traps and then maybe there's a bunch of groups of people all come together and they're kind of gathered around and they're just chucking darts in there on them. And you know, when you find those sites, there's just projectile points everywhere. Um, they're, they're pretty fascinating. Um, and so when we excavate those sites, oftentimes you can't, there's no evidence left of the trap, the wood that was used to build the, the corrals, so to speak, it's all gone, but you just find lots of projectile points in a weird place. And it's like, well, what's going on here? Sometimes if you're lucky, the bone will have gone down in a royal and be preserved and there'll be evidence of it. Um, so that was kind of what was going on over vast areas. Not so much down here in Southern Arizona that we see, but it is around. So 
this is an example, and I'll pass this around. This is just an example of the size drop off in projectile points. It starts out early on, you got Clovis. There's a huge gap here. This is to goes starts now at about four, this is like 12, 13,000 years. This is like 4,000 years ago. And then these are the these point styles here were all used with the atlatl and the dark during this time period, Cienega time period, which actually both of these are Cienega, we see both. We see little teeny points that were probably used with the bow and arrow and we see large dart points. So they were kind of doing both. They didn't completely give up on the atlatl and they're using both. And then about 1,500 years ago, we stopped seeing the larger points altogether, and we just see these little points, the arrow points. And so I'll just pass this around. It's just kind of an idea. These are all points that are made out of rock out of the Santa Cruz River here in Tucson. He made them, too. I made them. So they're <laughs> actually, I'm lying to you. The little teeny ones are actually real um, projectile points. They're from So some North. incredible lithic artistry here. Go ahead and pass that around. So one of the things is, is that you, know, you can see the, the decrease in point size. And the, one of the reasons that that's going on is as through time, populations are getting larger. There's more and more people out there. There's more and more people hunting. And so it could explain why the points are getting smaller because they're doing less and less hunting. When we excavate these archaeological sites around here, in the earlier sites, what we call, what, mostly what we've worked on is the, what we call the early agricultural time period. In the earliest of the early agricultural period sites, we find a lot more projectile points. And then through time, by the time you get into Hohokam sites, you don't see a lot of projectile points very often. They're, they're here, they're there, but they're kind of rare. They're Earlier not everywhere. on, there's a lot more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, they're here, they're there, they're not everywhere. But yeah, I mean, and the ones that you see are small. You'll see when that comes around. Uh, and it, as Alan was saying, part of the reason for this is that the animals are changing because there's more people and there are people not moving often compared to how they used to be. People are settling down more and more on the landscape through time. They're doing more and more farming through time, especially as we get into later periods. And that environment is not really conducive to having giant herds of deer around, at least in the southwest. So if you talk to people from like the east, deer love the edge areas next to cornfields. There's all that wet, brushy stuff that the East has that they can hide in. Um, for example, if you, go, if you drive down a road there, you know how you can't see the sides of the highway? You're enclosed in this creepy green tunnel. <laughs> I'm from the Southwest, so this was horrifying to me. Where am I going? <laughs> um, the Southwest doesn't have that. When you get the edge of a field here, you might have some brush, but you can see a long way, and there's not as much room for those bigger animals to hide. So when you have a large village of people for hundreds of years, sometimes in one place, farming, it's easier for them to hunt out animals that are deer size and pronghorn size right around their village in that area where they go every day. And the things that are left in that area right around where they go every day are things that breed a lot, like rabbits, right? So things that breed fast and things that like disturbance vegetation uh, and little critters that you can hunt a whole bunch of them and they just make more and they love to steal your food and go through your trash and raid your fields and stuff like that. Um, deer would like to raid fields too, but it's just harder for them to hide in these places around villages. So the things that people have access to are changing and their weapons are changing. So does anybody have any questions right now again while we're moving along here, kind of going through this? In the Midwest, we have uh, what's called buffalo jumps. Have you found any here in this area? Well, interestingly enough, um, <laughs> we've been doing a little project with the uh, Ark and His Society down near um, in the Chiricahuas, down at Garden Canyon. And we've got, we think, buffalo. We've got a bunch of buffalo bones coming down a little swale. Um, but we haven't actually, they have not actually been identified 100% yet for being that. Um, but maybe, it's, it's likely. The, if the, in the excavations, we came down through a kind of a Cienega deposit, which is a, a wet, watery deposit from um, a, where springs were coming up and water was sitting around and the soils were very organic and very rich. And it was a really great place that later uh, agriculture folks like to grow crops in. Um, but down coming down through this, there's all kinds of artifacts through 
we got middle archaic all the way through late prehistoric artifacts mixed all the way down through the clays right down onto this bed of rocks and cobbles and all the cobbles and rocks are like they're monos half of them are monos half of them are matates i mean there's just all kinds of artifacts in here thrown in over the top of this bed of large bones they're they look like either bison or cow. We really, really hope they're not cow, but they haven't <laughs> been identified yet. So um, there's a little bit left to be done on it, a lot left to be done on it. But it's really fascinating, because if they are bison, it's a bit of a smaller variety than what's seen on the plains. These guys were kind of adapted down maybe more for the desert. And that and site is towards the end of the time period where we would get bison in the Southwest. After that, they're pretty much they're limited to the plains later on in time. So uh, a lot of southwestern prehistory, those things are gone. And when we find them in sites, we find them at sites that are at the edge of the plains or places where people with, were, were trading with people who had access to those kinds of grassland environments that the bison like, but they're not living here so much anymore. Yeah. So we wouldn't have, from later time periods, we wouldn't have those here, but that's probably where some of the bison bone that we do find occasionally in southwestern sites is coming from, is places like that. And then the southwestern people are probably trading for hides. Often there'll be little bison foot bones, which that's not a very tasty piece of the bison, right? So it's probably coming in on a hide that was traded. It's a good suck toy for a baby, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think we have another question over here. I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't seen them, but from looking up there, it looks like the Clovis was a lot larger than the other ones. That looked more like a dirty, hairy type. And then they went smaller, like a 22. Do they? travel farther with a smaller one? It seemed like you'd get more bang for your buck with a heavier one. Well, the little teeny ones, when the Riker Mount went around, the little cases, those are arrow points. So on an arrow, you have the little itty bitty guys. But you're right, they do get a lot smaller. But the animals got a lot smaller. Once mammoths were gone, they weren't really making those really big ones anymore. They just, you know, they're making long ones. It, there's, there's, a, there's a huge gap in that plate of projectile points I passed around. There's a lot of other styles of projectile points that were made. We don't find a lot of those down here in southern Arizona, but you go over into New Mexico, you get into Folsom. Folsom's not here. Southern Arizona down here, I don't know, I haven't heard of a single Folsom point that's been found in this part of the world. So for whatever reason, they're just not coming right down into this area. They're up on the plateau up north, and then they're down coming around in Mexico and other places, but they're just not here. The little teeny ones, people kind of argue about, well, why would you even bother to use a point if it's that tiny? I mean, can't you just sharpen a stick and use that as your arrow and for shooting something like a quail? I mean, you don't necessarily need a nice obsidian projectile point to shoot a quail. They're just little fluff balls, right? So there's some argument about what those tiny points are actually for. And I think you did some research on this, right? Yeah, we did. It. I did. It. I made some points for Mythbusters actually one time, and they did an experiment using shooting sticks that were just sharpened, arrows that were just sharpened with the wood, and then with projectile points on them. And the projectile points got a little bit better penetration um, than just the wood dowels. But there's some. There's more to be done with that. I mean, they, they could have worked. Just using a sharp stick could have worked. Yeah, especially for little things where you don't actually have to penetrate very far. Yeah. If you're just sort of stunning it, you don't want to blow up your quail. There's, the, the points are really good for poking through hide. Hide is a really tough thing to puncture a hole through. And so you want your projectile points to be a little bit wider than the sh your force shaft that's going to come in behind it. So they open up a bigger hole allows more of that energy to punch that force shaft deeper into the animal and hopefully into a vital where you're going to kill it. With the arrows, I think that in a lot of cases, they might have gone in much deeper. And so by having force shafts on them, it just made it easier to change them out afterwards. But with the bigger animals, you want your dart to fall off and the force shaft to be in there and then the animal runs and it bleeds and it does more damage you know, to it. Yeah. If I got off course there. Another question? Right over here. Is it possible that the, the points were for post-impact uh, damage because the leverage of the shaft would be moving around causing cutting, whereas just this, the round shaft itself would probably just slide out? Yeah, it, exactly. And, and you got a point comes in and hits a bone and explodes and it's going to put a lot of junk in there, you know, a lot of pieces of fractured glass and stuff, which are going to cause it to bleed all the more and do more damage. So it certainly doesn't hurt. 
Does anyone have, have blood to... sausage for dinner? Yeah, but you, do, and you, have, <laughs> you have to be careful when you're eating that meat later on because you bite down on a piece of that. Oh, you know. That's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Are you familiar with a site they dug up at 19 and Duval Mine Road a couple of years ago? Not I actually am not either. I don't no, know. Okay. What. I was just wondering what they found there. Because I know that they closed the highway, you know, and did a lot of digging before they let it go ahead. Yeah, probably a bunch of pit houses, I would guess. Um, a bunch of what? Pit houses. The, oh, okay. the houses that they built. Um, ah. What time period? I, I, that's one I don't know anything about. There's how many archaeology companies are there in Tucson? Like, more than most places <laughs> yeah there's a lot so there's a lot of work going on and a lot of the time we don't know yeah. okay next question is back here hi maybe you already answered my question but i can't hear really well back here there are some examples of clovis points really small clovis points as small as some san pedro points found uh, associated with some megafauna remains for example, in Lainer or in at Fin del Mundo in Sonora, we have two Clovis points, really small, associated with the tears, with the gonfa tears. So, is the size what is really important, or is the way that you are using those points? Yeah, I mean, there are there are little teeny teeny tiny Clovis points, and maybe they were for a completely different purpose. Very likely. Um, we just don't know much about them. They're so rare, you know. There, there are probably more of them out there than we realize. They're just, it's hard to interpret them, if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly. And I think um, this brings us back to that issue of so many of the Paleo-Indian sites that we know about, we know about them because they were obvious. They were large, extinct megafauna kill sites. And they're probably doing all kinds of other things that were missing many of those sites. So I'm sure they were hunting smaller things, definitely deer-sized things, probably all kinds of sizes of things. And then one thing we haven't really talked about yet is that they're not just hunting things with projectiles, they're hunting them with all kinds of other techniques too. So snares and nets and rabbit sticks and all kinds of other things are used for hunting besides those points that we're always kind of drawn to. And those were actually really important animals in the diet too. So rabbits, rabbits for example, when we get into these settled farming villages where people are living for a long time, that's most of the bone that we find in the sites. I actually brought a show and tell thing too. It's not as pretty as Alan's, but this is a bag of the animal bones from the field school that we're running at the Dinwiddie site in Southwest New Mexico. And you'll see that there's a few toe bones of deer sized critters, and there's a whole bunch of little rabbit sized pieces. And that's pretty normal. Actually, this has more toes. I just grabbed a bag. Um, this has more toes than even an average bag of big things. A lot of times, almost all the bone is from rabbits and from little rodents. And they're not going to hunt those the same way. They have a lot of other technology they use for that. This being one of them, uh, this is not a boomerang, but um, I haven't tried to see if it'll come back. I don't think Alan? it would. Alan, could you reposition your microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. So this, this is what we call a rabbit stick. And so it's just a carved wooden stick into kind of a boomerang shape. Just makes it fly real nice. So these sticks they would throw at rabbits you know, they, in a kind of a motion like this. And so, you know how rabbits are, they bounce around and they're going all over the place. So they're pretty hard to shoot. Um, and, and if you think about it, the kill zone, if you shoot an arrow at a rabbit, and I'm kind of talking here later in time, we're talking about agricultural time period now. So we're, we're saying they're done with the atlatls, that's all gone, and now they're using the bow and arrow. So if you're out there hunting and you see a rabbit out there, you can easily shoot it with the bow and arrow. And I'm sure they did quite often. But if you think about it, with a bow and arrow, you've got a kill zone, a strike zone, the size of the end of this point. And it's same with the, the Paleo Indian points, all these points. You can count on one shot with your whatever projectile you're using. You can count on one shot. If you miss, you're going to break the point. If you hit it, you're probably going to break the point. So you've got one shot. So I'm sure that they did a certain amount of rabbits with these. But this weapon right here, and we find these in rock shelters the same way as we find the atlatls in rock shelters, and these go all the way up till contact. And in Mexico, probably in places they're still using them. In other parts of the world, they're still using them. Um, but you throw these sideways, like this, boom, at the rabbit. I set that off. At the rabbit, and you've got a strike zone like this. 
So you're not so worried. All you're worried about is hitting the rabbit and breaking, hurting it, injuring it, and then you can run up and club it, and then you've got it and you're ready to go. So say you're an agriculturalist and you've got your fields out there and you've got all these bunnies continually coming in and critters coming in to raid your gardens and stuff. So one of the things you might do is set up all the kids out there, set the boys out there with a bunch of these and roam around the fields chasing the rabbits. Kids might be bringing home more meat than the old man. They probably were, actually. Because, Once it got harder to find the deer, yeah, that's what was out there. By the time agriculture comes in, and pretty much by the time Hohokam times or ceramic time periods, when you excavate these sites, what is it, 85, 95% of the bone is small mammal. It's rabbit or smaller. And not only that, but we think about 80% of the calories people were getting were not from meat at all, they were from corn. Yeah. So most of the food is actually corn and other things that people are growing. Those crops are way more important to people in a lot of ways than the animals are. The animals mean a lot, but they don't necessarily contribute a lot to the diet. So probably a lot of the meat that they were getting was from kids throwing rabbit sticks. Uh, and also from keeping smaller things out of the fields like gophers. You can read ethnographic accounts of people sticking and sticks down in gopher holes and twisting them, and they twist up the gopher's fur, and then pull it out on the other stick and bock it on the head and eat it. In some places, they would grind them up with a mono and matate and make a yummy sort of rodent paste out of it. Uh, but all these little morsels of meat, they're really, they help you a lot nutritionally. So in a, in a time and place where people are getting a lot of their food from plants, just having that little bit of extra nutrition from meat, especially at certain times of year when you're living mostly off stored food, that helps you absorb the vitamins and minerals and other things in the rest of your food better because you get that little nutritional boost. So, I mean, a pack rat, that's a good job for your kid if they bring home a pack rat from the field. That really helps boost the entire family's food, especially yeah. if you throw it in a stew or something like that. So they're using things like the rabbit sticks, snares. If you look uh, at pictures of membrace bowls, you can see scenes of people doing both those things. There's membrace bowls that have people with rabbit sticks. There's membrace bowls that show people herding rabbits into nets. Yeah. We didn't talk about this very much, but rabbits respond different ways to hunting. So for example, if you imagine driving down the road when you see jackrabbits, what do they do? Well, jackrabbits, yeah, jackrabbits will run and cottontails will freeze. Cottontails are the ones that just will not move from in front of your car. You're like, move, I'm going to run you over, move. And they're just going, no. <laughs> yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw one run over on Grant today. I mean, they're, they're yeah. everywhere. They freeze yeah. and they hope that you don't see them. Jackrabbits run away. That allows you to hunt them differently. You'd have to hunt cottontails with something like a rabbit stick or a bow and arrow. But jackrabbits, you can herd them into these big nets. And then you can go and club them all on the head. And then you have a whole bunch of rabbits and you can have a party. Uh, which is something we think people probably did when they needed a whole bunch of meat for something you can't count on getting a big animal but you can count on getting a whole bunch of jackrabbits probably especially if all your guests come out and you slaughter the jackrabbits together and then you can have a big feast together yeah and if, and you, if, 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 if your farmer's almanac is telling you it's going to be a particularly cold winter you can take all those rabbit furs and make some rabbit fur blankets for the mm -hmm. coming cold winter, you know? So they would use everything. If you go to the Arizona State show. Museum, one of the coolest things they have there sometimes on display is this giant net, and it's made out of hair. It's made out of human hair. And how long is it? Does anyone remember? Oh. It's close to 100 yards. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. And that's probably the kind of thing that that net was used for, was hunting big packs of jackrabbits. Uh, you could just herd them into that hair net that you've made in the winter evenings and, and get them. Literally. <laughs> yeah. And then snares in the fields. It's a good way to protect your fields. Yeah, you don't want, and, 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 and as Joyce can, you don't want any critters in your fields. You get the pocket gophers. They would have been out going after every kind of critter that was in their fields. Because if you've got the digging rodents in your fields, if you've got agricultural fields, where you're growing crops and you run an irrigated water into these fields, if you've got these digging rodents and your canal's coming along and it hits a rodent hole and your water goes down the rodent hole, next thing you know, you've got piping vents and your field is running out the side of, a, of an arroyo that's created by this rodent hole, you're dead in the water. You're out there plugging those holes as fast as you can. It's all the more reason that the people are out in the fields. You, you just have to be on it day and night, you know. I was telling Alan about this earlier, but I worked on a project with a guy named Wesley Miles from the Healy River Indian community, and he was doing some experimental fields where he was trying to grow crops with traditional seeds, using traditional methods, 
as an experiment, and he had this really interesting protocol mapped out where he was going to vary the water that got to these fields and vary different things about their placement and things like that. And he actually wasn't able to do a lot of the really interesting things that he would proposed to do because the rodents ate all his crops. <laughs> so he got things to sprout, and then the rodents just went in there and devoured them. And he was a college student. He couldn't sleep out there every night with a rabbit stick and kill the things that were trying to raid his fields. So they kind of messed up part of his experiment. But that's how big a problem these things are. They can just eat your entire crop if you don't stay on top of it. Could you quickly repeat that process you had of putting the stick down the hole for the pocket gophers? I really need to know. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, Joyce has a, a farming plot out in Oro Valley where she's growing a lot of traditional crops. And Alan actually said if he could catch a gopher, he'd eat it. <laughs> we'll grind it with the mono and the matate. Yeah, but if you read some of the ethnographies, they actually talk about people being out in the fields and they stick a stick in the gopher hole and twist it, and it snags their fur, and you just yank it out and bash it. And you have a snack, or your lunch. It sounds a lot easier to do than it is, I'll bet you. <laughs> okay, um, if I could change the topic for just a sec. Um, on all of your tables, um, there's a handout about the hands-on archaeology program which this talk is sort of a uh, part of. And um, at Archaeology Southwest, we're starting to do some really interesting things to provide people with experiences in working with stone tools, working with um, uh, ancient technologies. And it's part of a really long tradition at Arizona of, of processes of experimental archaeology. So would you two be willing to talk a little bit about that program? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we last year in Oro Valley, over a year ago now, we started the construction of a pit house that is, uh, a, basically it's based on the floor plans of pit houses that were dug up at um, Honeybee Village out there. And we finished it last year, it turned out really nice. And then we had those big rains late in the summer. And they wreaked some serious havoc on it. Um, and so we're going back out now and we're gonna start reworking it, getting it put back together again, and then we're going to build two or three or four more houses with different types of styles of um, architecture that we see archaeologically. So when we go out and we excavate these sites, as an archaeologist we go out with these big backhoes and we strip it off and we dig the house out and we're looking at the foundations, but we don't really know what the superstructures look like on these things. So. We spend, what we're trying to do is go out there and reconstruct what we think they look like and see how these, this, they would have worked. And so that's, the, that's what we're trying to do for people, give you guys an experience. You can come out with me and spend half a day and we'll work on doing all kinds of things. I got stone axes you can learn how to chop wood with, we'll mix mud, we'll uh, weave the, the superstructure together, dig, the, dig holes for the house foundations and post holes with digging sticks and baskets. So um. we do this at the field school in Southwest New Mexico also. And that was really fun last summer. Uh, they, we have an experimental component of the, the course. So the students are doing the traditional sorts of field school things. They're going on survey, they're excavating, but they're also rotating through an experimental component. Uh, and Alan led these students in building a replica of an adobe room that looks like the ones that we're excavating from the, the 1300s. And it was really, there was a point at which I think all of our hair was kind of standing on end because there was a point at which the height of the walls of the pit house, or the, the house, the adobe room that Alan was building, the height of the walls was about the same as the height of our excavation. And the walls looked so similar. So the students would be out excavating and we're seeing these cracks in the adobe and we were talking about things like, oh, this is supposed to be puddled adobe, but these cracks are making brick shapes, and that's really weird. I wonder why that's happening. And we got home and we looked at the work that the experimental crew had done that day, and the adobe room was cracking into these shapes that looked like bricks. And it was the loads of adobe that the students were scooping up and padding together into the wall. And it looked just like what we were excavating. It was really cool, but it was also kind of like, it was almost eerie because they looked so similar. And we really learned a lot from, from doing that, and we have plans to keep on doing that, trying different methods of plastering the outsides and different mixes for the adobe and things like that. Uh, but it really, I think, enriched the way all of us, not just the students, but even those of us who've been excavating those kinds of sites for a long time. It really added something to the way that we saw them because yeah. 
suddenly we could imagine actually building this thing. And we were seeing things that we had worked on the day before making that looked so much like the things that we were excavating out in the field. Yeah, you know, there's so many little subtle things that when you're excavating a, a pit house or something, you don't see or understand. So then when you start to build them and do them, and a lot of stuff makes more sense. It's like, oh my gosh, that's why they did it that way. You know, I, you don't think about it normally. And so it's really great. And, and the same with the other stuff we're doing. There's uh, going to be a number of um, flint napping workshops happening all the time, which is one of my favorite things to do. I love to make projectile points. And so uh, we'll be running all kinds of foot napping workshops, atlatl workshops. You'll be able to go and make your very own atlatl, uh, museum quality atlatl out of oak. We use stone tools and modern tools a little bit to help you get done um, in, in the proper time period. And I'm gonna attempt a three quarter groove axe workshop class. It'll be two classes, but we're gonna try that out. Uh, we've been doing a lot of experimenting with putting handles on three-quarter groove axes to where you can actually go out and chop a tree down with them. When you find them in the sites and they're so cool, they're so neat, but you put a handle on them and then, wow, they're really, really neat. They, and go out and chop and, and they work, you know? And if you pick them up, like if you've seen a museum or if you've ever held one, it's kind of hard for me at least to imagine using them because they're not sharp. I mean, these ground stone axes, they're shaped like an ax, but they don't have a sharp edge like the axes that we're all used to using that are metal. Uh, they have more of a wedge as an yeah. edge. Uh, and it was kind of hard for me always to imagine, how does that really work? Do you just mash the tree down? Um, <laughs> and you kind of do in a way. <laughs> yeah, but they actually do work. I helped at one of our events in Oro Valley, and I was able to actually take the bark off a log with one, and it worked just fine. It's just a little different motion than we're used to. But things like that, they really bring the archaeology alive, I think, because you say, oh, this does work. Oh, this is something I can imagine people doing. Yeah. It's not just a, an isolated artifact. It's yeah. something you can imagine using in daily life. Yeah. Or if Alan, you're Alan, you actually use it in daily life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On your arrowhead um, demo that you sent around, the, the ends of the arrowheads have different shapes. Now, is this indicative of the era or is it indicative of the use? Um, it's the era. Um, it, in a cultural group, any, at any one point in time, everybody living in that group were making the same style, the same shape of arrow points, and they were notching them, the little notches in the end where they hafted them onto the four shafts. They all made them the same way. And it's interesting, and it's across the board. So cultural groups and over vast regions, there's even kind of different cultural groups, people made their points in very, very similar ways. And it's largely because their equipment was all very similar. A group of hunters out on a hunt, one of the hunters might use up all of his four shafts and all of his equipment, but he could borrow some from another, hunt, another hunter over that would work just the same in his hunting equipment because you have the same balances, the same weights. So you don't want to have one with a big, huge projectile point on it all of a sudden that's going to, you know, you're not, it's not going to fly right. Everything depended on these things being, having the same. Uh, uh, every time you used, every time you threw your dart, you knew what was going to happen. You're not going to add things into the mix that are going to cause weirdness and wackiness. So it's, it's through time, the styles change. And that's what's really neat about projectile points is, you know, you might have a style that lasts for a thousand years or 300 years. And by sites that we've excavated and found these points in them, by radiocarbon dating the hearths, by tree ring dating, we know roughly the age. Or by ceramics, we know when this point style was made. So when you find them on the surface, it's like, oh, hey, here's a Sienega point. I know this point is about 1,500 years old. You know, and so for archaeologists out on survey, when you find arrowheads on the ground, they're very nice. They're very handy for dating. It tells you who was there and when. Another thing um, that's really neat about that is the degree to which people in the past were aware of this too. I mean, they would have recognized each other's point styles if there was a group that made a different style of point. And people in the past recognized older point styles too. We've both worked in a lot of sites where you'll find a point from hundreds or thousands of years before the rest of that site. And you know that somebody who lived there was out walking around and they found an old point and they thought, oh, how cool, and they took it home and they did something with it. Sometimes they put them in special deposits in the floors of rooms or the walls of rooms. Sometimes they seem to have just kind of kept them out. 
but yeah. they were just like us and that they saw these things from long, long ago and I thought, oh, how neat, it's a thing from long, long ago and they knew what it was and we can see people, for example, I don't know, 800 years ago picking up points from 2,000 years ago. It's really neat to, to find those points that are kind of out of place like that. Yeah, and it's another thing that could have happened too. You have these earlier sites and in a lot of cases in the earlier sites, they were flaking pretty high quality rock. Those guys were moving around bigger and bringing in nicer, high quality rock. Later folks walking along might find where they were flaking it and find these pieces of rock and pick them up and reuse them, which is gonna make that older stuff, there's less of it gonna be obvious on the landscape. And so that's one of the reasons why we don't see as much of that too, possibly. Yeah. Okay, one more question here. When the projectile point style changes, do you think that's an indication of a new and better technological development, or is that an indication that the target has changed, therefore the point style has to change? It's a really good question, and it's a really hard one to answer, because sometimes it could mean that one group moved out of an area and another group moved in with a different kind of projectile point or it could mean it's just changed through time. And in the scale that we're looking at, it's really hard to see that, you know? You dig a village and you got 30 pit houses, but there's some that have kind of a little different projectile point in them, but they're so close in age, it's hard to say. Was the, were these before these houses? Uh, it's, it's a tough, tough thing. One but, of the arguments, as uh, I understand at least from, um, this idea about whether or not people were using ad laddles in the Paleo-Indian period, uh, as I think the detractors of that, people who thought that the ad laddle wasn't here until this recent study came out, um, actually thought that points with a stem on them were marking the appearance of ad laddles, those archaic points in the, the box yeah. that Alan passed uh -huh. around. Some people thought that that's actually when ad laddles appeared and that the, the points with a fluted end, the points that don't have a stem, but they have that long flake taken out the center, uh, those were actually for throwing spears. Uh, or, so that or was. Thrusting, yeah. yeah, or thrusting spears. So that was one argument that that style change actually meant that the weaponry changed. Uh, but this new study of the impact fractures doesn't seem to support that. It seems to suggest that you could haft your point, you could attach it to the shaft all kinds of different ways and still use it with an, with an ad ladle. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alan, Karen, thank you very much.